Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of this new format of following Swift Evolution. I have other videos where I go through each proposal that has been implemented in this new version of Swift, currently Swift 4.2, and in these videos I go specifically and dissect what's going on with this new proposal, what's the new powers that we have in Swift, what are the new changes and all that jazz. They are more technical videos and where I go deep into the code and I check what's going on. In these videos, instead, I want to bring the Swift Forums conversations into the broader the community. There are a lot of conversations going there every day, and there is a lot of things going on and changes that will happen in the future of Swift, but there are a lot of things that are coming that are super exciting, and that people it's not aware until they are already an Xcode in the new version. So with these videos, my goal is to bring the community, the people that it's not all day in the Swift forums like some of us, into this conversation and in, with that way help the evolution of Swift be better. This is not gonna be a video series about specific things about iOS or Mac development. This is about Swift, specific things about Swift. So if you want to know about other stuff that is not specifically what's going on in the Swift evolution, there are a lot of newsletters, there are a lot of other video series that talk about that for iOS development or whatever you prefer. But this is all about Swift Evolution. Let's start talking about a new announcement that has come up in the Swift forums and it's about the core team wanting to implement an LSP language service to support Swift and also C, Objective-C and C++ to improve the support for any editor and in any platform. LSP stands for Language Server Protocol and it's a standard developed by, by Microsoft. It helps any compiler, any language, any interpreter to provide an, a standard protocol for other editors or I, and IDEs to integrate with it. This brings jump to definition, call hierarchy, search symbols, highlighting, all this stuff that we are used to to have with Xcode when it works. It will bring all of that to other languages. So if you are using Visual Studio, Sublime, or any other text editor that supports LSP, rest assured that in the future you will be able to use it. This is super important for people that just server-side development in Linux or it does like other stuff of development with Swift and Linux. Up until now, it was like a big barrier not having a nice, editor or even an IDE, even if a lot of people doesn't want to use them, it's nice to have this functionality in your editor. Hopefully in the future with this LSP, we'll have this available on any platform. The interesting thing is that it's not only for all other editors or other platforms, Xcode in the long term, it's supposed to also change and use this new service. And meanwhile, during the development, we will be able to select a toolchain in the same way that we can select a toolchain to use the new Swift before it's released we will be able to select a toolchain that uses this new LSP system to offer highlighting and, and all the code completion, all the stuff that we're used to Xcode. So we can give it a try and report bugs before it's released and probably integrated into Xcode. The other interesting stuff is that Xcode does some stuff that it's not part of the server protocol standard. And what the core team has said here is that they are happy to input the extensions that are they are needed for Xcode into the server protocol standard for other languages and other IDEs to profit from. So it will be nice to see Swift giving back to the community for something so important as this that it's used on every language because for example Visual Studio Code it uses it for every language is integrated like this so it's super interesting. On the interesting announcements about proposals here we have the proposal 0228 fix expressible by string interpolation. This is a proposal that I've been waiting for for a long time. This is a super long weighted proposal to improve and make decent finally the string interpolation system in Swift. I will talk about this because it's accepted in a future following Swift video episode. But in short, the current system of string interpolation is super cool for the usage. But on the implementator side, if you want to implement string interpolation support in a custom type, the information about the type that was passed at uh, the interpolation time, it's lost. So there is no way to know which type was given, which limits a lot the possibilities that you have with this steam interpolation system. With this new system, instead, you keep all that information, which allows 
implementators to do super cool things that we will see in an upcoming video. But this is something that other communities, like for example on Ruby, like the, the interpolation system in Ruby is quite powerful. And I explored a while ago what you can do with that in, in terms of domain-driven development, which allows you to get rid of strings, remove the strings, and instead you can use the strings to initialize other more powerful types. And blending these two walls in a, in a nice way without much friction in the middle, it's, it's super necessary to have a proper string interpolation system. I'm glad that Swift finally has it. Let's take a look at some pitches that have been done in Swift Evolution. The first one is dynamic method replacement. It's another pitch to make Swift more like Objective-C and allow Swisslink. I'm not convinced personally this is the right approach or that is actually necessary without more concrete examples, to be honest. I think having something well thought and well designed and probably powerful enough to do the, the same things that people want to do with this. Something like Remember the old like property behaviors proposal, more powerful system mixing systems, or even some type of behavior driven development where you can hook into, into the before and after calls on methods. That it's probably super interesting to discuss, but I think that allowing willy nilly swizzling to replace things uh, doesn't seem good, to be honest. The big argument that I always see on these pitches is about fixing broken SDKs. So when Apple releases something, then you can actually hook into it, like and change the implementation and fix it yourself, which I know that there are people that ships SDKs or apps that have to work around it. They also need this feature. But I think that's, uh, uh, that's the situation, that's the status quo that we are in because the language and the tooling we have been using. I can see a future where with a better language like Swift and the kind of errors that we're talking about like could not happen. And if we aim in that direction and instead of giving a way to patch everything which, without actually solving the problems, I think it will be more interesting to put our efforts in. Now that said, I know this is super interesting proposal that a lot of people is talking about it. Look at all the discussion that has been going and it's all about that like there are advantages to it but i think ultimately we need to think about how this matches what we require to make on swift and not just do it again because objective c has it so if you're interested into this i recommend you to read this discussion because they talk about some stuff that you probably don't think about when you're coding because if you don't require to patch the runtime in this way you usually don't don't require this kind of feature so now let's talk about another pitch. In this time, it's to amend a previous proposal. It's actually the proposal I was talking about before. Remember that I already talked about dynamic member lookup on my channel. And this time it's the second part of that dynamic system called dynamic callable. This was already accepted and approved and the implementation is going on. But this pitch is to amend uh, a part of the proposal. Concretely, on that proposal, you can allow the, the implementer to implement these two different calls, which one of them is for languages or for times where you actually need the label in the parameters. On the other is without labels. Here they call it keywords. So these two, like you can actually implement them both, but then after having some time to implement it and use it a little, like there are some issues with it, mainly that it's unclear first for the user which one will be called depending on which on which cases. For example, when no keywords are given, which one takes priority? The the behavior, because it's not super clear, it can be surprising depending on like of the on the return type if they are different, because you don't exactly know the compiler which one is gonna pick. Okay? So apart from that, it looks like there is some some tricky things to do in the implementation because of this, but that's not the main problem with it. it the main problem is to facilitate to the users of this, of this feature to know exactly what's going on, which is super important when we are writing code. So the pitch here is to fix this. There are some alternatives to it. People is talking about it, like with the experience that they are gaining, like they prefer one or the other. If you are interested in this, take a look. If not, again, I'm gonna talk about this when it's finally in Swift five hopefully 
and it's going to be super exciting. Time to talk about proposals. There are some proposals, but I'm going to talk about two interesting ones. One of them is these flat and nested optionals resulting from the try question mark. The try question mark is what you use when you are calling a throwing function, but you don't actually care about the error that it's throwing. You just care that if there is an error, just give me an nil. So convert, it in, convert the throwing error into an optional and I don't really care which one is specifically. So that's super useful, but there are some edge cases where what, if what you're calling is already optional, then the try question mark gives you an nested optional, and there are people that want to change this to simplify it, to actually make sure that there is only one level of optionality on that return type. I honestly don't have a strong opinion in either case. The proposal talks about other parts of the language where this happens, and if that's the case, I wouldn't mind having it also here just for consistency, but doing it also, it probably hurts people that it's relying on this, so it's going to be a source compatibility breakage, and that's not cool. But I don't have that issue ultimately to happen often, uh, probably it's because, I mean, I don't know. Like, I find it weird that uh, you are calling a function that it's throwing and also giving you an optional value, like, these cases don't happen, probably like with the better API design you can avoid the majority of them, but for the cases that they still happen, I don't think it's a big deal to have these in the language, but again, for consistency sake, if it helps. My opinion is that we just need to be a little careful. In one side, we can, if we do this, the majority of cases will be simpler for people, and yeah, you just return an optional, and you don't actually care about nested optionals. In the other case, maybe doing this magic hurts the comprehension of, of this behavior. What I really don't understand is that some people is jumping in and also saying that the nested optionals should completely be banned. I really don't get that part and probably I'm missing something because for me like an option is just a structure that can have something inside, it's just that the language give nice syntax sugar for it but it's just another type like, like you could have yourself. Like we're not saying that we are going to ban any enum that it can be recursively nested, like that doesn't make any sense. And I, I get the desire of limiting the accidental usage of nested optionals, that's fine. So this proposal may be fine, but removing completely the nested optionals doesn't make any sense to me. Another super interesting proposal to talk about is the SIMD vectors proposal. This is uh, a topic that I'm not really qualified to give a strong opinion about it, but at least I can give you an overview of what I think this actually will mean for us. This is kind of a low-level stuff, like the majority of people writing applications on iOS or Mac like don't really even care or don't even know that this is a thing. But when you want to have some parts of your code base more performant, this is an option that it's usually used in, in maybe not on app development, for, for example, for game developers, this is the bread and butter of their job. SIMD stands for single instruction and multiple data. This is useful if you think that you have, I don't know, like an array of data that you want to process, and each the process of every item is independent. You could, for example, use SIMD to kind of parallelize, although it's not the same, but you could parallelize at the CPU level the processing of this array in, in batches of four or whatever the same instruction supports. So instead of doing a for loop between zero and 100, you do a for loop on batches of four, and you get all these, these four items in memory and you tell the, the CPU to process them at the same time. And because the way the CPUs are done nowadays, they can process in batch in the same way like if they were processing just one. Like for them it's the same because they load everything in batches in memory anyway, so they can process it at once. So Swift right now can use the Apple SIMD on Darwin platforms, but it's like you are using C libraries to hook into these CPU instructions because each CPU and each platform has a slightly variance of what they support and you need to be careful about that. So what the proposal does is basically bring these APIs into a more swifty world. So the discussion is around how we will name these things. We can just, for example, do float that vector or do a generic vector type that, that it's specialized into the float behavior, for example, but then brings issues because you cannot specialize that for any, any type, so you, can, you need to start bringing protocols. In any case, the discussion is super interesting because it means that we will bring a lot of new stuff into, into the standard library. Another conversation is, should we put this in another module and not 
important to understand the library. So the conversation is super interesting. If you are at least a little interested in these kind of things, like more low level stuff, I really recommend you to take a look at this because it's something that Swift needs in the long term and that's super interesting to have. But more importantly, I wanted to bring a specific post on this thread. And it's this one here. Basically says that we should, for these kind of things, we should have more time for the proposal review, which is fine. I don't think the core team has been super strict about timing anyway. But I feel like Swift Evolution should, and I said that many times, it should provide, first of all, more time for these, these proposals that we don't really know what's going to be the impact. And, and it will be an impact that we need to live with for the rest of the Swift lifetime. And second, we should be able, which we are, but it's not as straightforward as I would like it, to just have a tool chain with that PR before it's merged and implemented it so people can easily incorporate that into Xcode and start playing with it and see how it feels and see how it will impact their code bases and start playing with it. This obviously can be done because you have the tool chains with the, the versions of Swift before they are released. But those two chains have already been merged and it's everything is confirmed, the proposal is accepted, so here you have it's already done. It's just that it's not released into Xcode, for example. But in my opinion, that's already delayed. We should be able to play with it before accepting a proposal. Other communities do something similar. An alternative is making the because for a proposal nowadays you need to have an implementation done. Maybe we could merge the implementation with a feature flag and release a new tool chain and allow people to enable the feature flag and play with it. I'm not sure, but I feel like some proposals, and we have seen this in the past, with things that the community was really bothered about when, with changes, I think we should allow the community to just give it a try easily because you cannot ask people to get the branch of that PR and compile it yourself, which takes a lot of time and then created a the toolchain for that. Even if it's simpler than, than before, it's still a pain in the ass to do, let's be honest. Just something we should be thinking about if we want to incorporate more people of the community into the evolution process. And finally for today, let's talk about Swift on the server. After the release of Neo, the adoption from popular Swift server-side frameworks like Kitura and Vapor and other people is already using it. The Swift server group seems to be working closer than ever before and with clear goals in mind for what's next for the Swift on the server. They started a new bunch of pitches and discussions about what's to come and what we should be focusing on. One of these first pitches is about crash recovery from server-side applications. We know that Swift error handling is somewhat special when it comes into like throwing errors or exceptions, especially compared with other popular languages, Java or C++. In Swift, we know there is no exceptions. You cannot throw an exception like in other languages. The error system is very explicit, so it can only throw an error, which is not an exception, on a specific places where the developer says that here there may be an error and you are forced to deal with it. The issue is that there are also other types of errors that we don't think about in our normal day-to-day -day development. For example, you could have an error where allocating memory fails. Like we don't deal with that on every time that we create a new, a new object on Swift. Or things like arithmetic operations that probably also can fail. All of this is to help the Swift goal of memory safety, which is really good for the things we want. On the server, it's a little different because on the server you have one process that it's dealing with many requests from many different clients and, and users. If one of these requests provokes a crash, like a crash like this that the, the Swift runtime will throw away the process, that's not good because you are losing all the other requests from other users that were not doing anything bad. So that's why there has to be a discussion and improvement on how to deal with these scenarios. We need a way for the server process to actually and like detect the crash hook into it and handle it and give a chance to the other request to finish, for example, or somehow communicate with a, a manager process that will redirect all these requests to another, another one. It's a tricky thing to make sure that it's fine because it's something that you want for server side, probably for some other cases you also need it, but on our day to day, I think it's fine as, as we are. Like another interesting topic coming up from the Swift server group, it's logging. And this probably is interesting for everybody because the thing that puts the server in a unique position is that Swift on servers are also part of a bigger ecosystem 
and there is usually ways to hook into external infrastructure to log and send logs to them and there are services that the only purpose is to gather the logs and filter them and make it easy for you to to see what's going on also you can hook into monitoring all of this is part of what makes the server world a thing the ecosystem is already existing so we swift on the server we are being introduced into an existing world but even in that situation we still need a proper api and a, a standard api to communicate and do this logging this discussion is super interesting i think you should take a look just even to see how an api design decisions are made how the trade-offs are analyzed the discussion goes about the, analyzing the advantages and disadvantages of global versus local loggers how to properly add context into the logs for example you need to know with this specific log ideally you will automatically to have already logged the http request environment that you are in so you don't have to do that every time but also if you do that then you start hitting performance uh, things so you need to be careful about that also it's a bunch of trade-offs and advantages and disadvantages that they need to be analyzed and, and thought about it's a great topic to be honest so like i recommend you to take a look this looks like the team has uh, some proposal in mind so they are going to start with that they are going to make a proposal and we're going to take a look at it and see how it goes from there so that's it for today this has been the eight topics that i wanted to present in this video about following swift evolution forums i hope you are more interested in it that you go and check them out yourself and if not you can tune in for my next video talking exclusively about things that are going on on swift evolution forum if you are more interested in knowing what the new proposals are and how swift is changing also remember to check out my videos about that where i show you what's going on on swift and what the new proposals features allow us to do and remember if you like this video press the like button and subscribe to get notifications about the new ones coming thank you for watching and see you next time